I'm going to make you a promise. Right here, right now, today. You, with my help, are going to find your place in the world. And today, you are going to find it like a poet. Now, this may sound like a grandiose promise, but I assure you that it is not. And it also may sound like I'm going to perform some magic trick and I'm going to ask you to close your eyes in a couple of seconds. That's not going to happen either, okay? <laughs> in fact, I'm going to require that you open your eyes up just a little bit wider so I can show you how every single day the ordinary, trivial, mundane, overlooked details are making all the difference in how successful we are at interfacing with the world that's right in front of us in the world that's happening all around us. This is going to require a slight, a very modest bit of retuning on your part, though, in order to do it. But if you commit to the principles of this exercise we are going to do, you will be able to see that there is a broad applicability to everyday, ordinary circumstances. Moments that pass by completely unnoticed. I call them the unremarkable moments in life. And the news here is that that makes up the vast majority of your time on this planet. Now, these things are just zipping past us every day. We're brushing our teeth, and then boom, out into the ether. We've already forgotten about it. But the remarkable thing about these unremarkable moments is that it's the one thing that everybody on this planet for sure has in common. And if you commit to the principles of the exercise that we are going to do here today, you will start to feel more fully invested, more fully integrated into the places through which you're passing on a daily basis. Now, this is an exercise, so that, is, that means it's going to require you to participate. But before we can even begin this exercise, I'm going to need you to select something to investigate, something to put your full energy upon. But for the purposes of today, we are not going to choose something. We are going to choose somebody. Now, I'm going to give you about five seconds here in a moment. I'm going to say go, and that'll be your cue to find that person. But you are going to choose someone. It could be someone to your left. Well, that's my left. <laughs> It could be someone to your right, that's my right. It could be someone three rows down, and for those of you who are starting to realize that I'm going to ask you to look perhaps deeply at another person, if that makes you at all squeamish or uncomfortable, feel free to leer at me. <laughs> I think you're all doing it right now anyways. <laughs> it doesn't really matter. <laughs> um, but that's what we're going to do. Um, and I'm going to give you five seconds to do it. Now, what we're going to do when I say go is choose someone. Five silent seconds and that's it. All you're going to do is select the person, okay? Ready? I want to hear this invisible pin drop, by the way, right here on this stage. Ready, set, go. Okay, stop. It doesn't make a difference who you choose. Like most things in life, the only important thing is that you make a choice. And so you've already made that choice. That's great. We are going to look at another, at another person, yes. But we are also, also going to open ourselves up to the possibility and the probability that other people are going to be looking at you. And we are going to find something unique in each other, something we weren't aware of before now and we're going to tuck it away in the backs of our minds and save it for later. Okay, now what we're looking for is a feature. This could be an item of clothing, a particular component of that item of clothing, a button, a zipper, it doesn't matter. If you're uh, within smelling distance of the person you chose, <laughs> right? Uh, it could be a particular perfume or cologne. If the person you selected has a three-year-old and a five-year-old at home like I do, then maybe you can pick out a new strand of gray hair because I assure you <laughs> that if they're like me, You've got at least one that's donning their quaff. So um, when I say go, I'm going to give you five seconds to do this, five silent seconds to select something, to put your full energy into somebody. 
And what you're going to get out of this, very small. It's easy, you know, lower the expectations. Isn't that the key to happiness? But what you're going to get out of this, later, <laughs> later tonight, tomorrow, maybe even 10 years from now, you'll be able to recall that detail with greater appreciation than you could possibly imagine. And more than simply being able to recall the detail, the emotional complexity of this moment here today will be right there with it. Now, when I say go, I'm going to give you five silent seconds, and I want you to put your energy on the person, and I want you to select a detail and tuck it away in the back of your minds. Five silent seconds. Ready, set, go. Okay, stop. Good. You've made a choice. Bravo. I mean, that's the first step. <laughs> um, we have just completed the first step of a three-step process towards finding our place in this world like poets. That first step is awareness. Now, awareness is something that poets practice daily. We are always on the lookout for new material, but our material can range from an ordinary wooden cooking spoon to a, a mote of dust on the wing of a death's head moth to that first warm smell of honeysuckle comes spring. And like you and I and everyone else in this room just did together, poets, we take that piece of material and then we try and understand it within the framework of a much larger context. Take that ordinary wooden cooking spoon I mentioned just a few moments ago, an ordinary simple device used to mix and stir and taste. I mean, you know, if you've never seen one before, <laughs> you can imagine it. It's a spoon about yay high and it's in a lot of kitchens in America. That's what it is. But that's not all it is. Take that ordinary wooden cooking spoon and put it in the hands of my grandmother who passed away almost 20 years ago and watch her start to stir salamini and cabbage come Christmas Eve. Maybe she sets it down on the counter for a second to rub her aching hands. Maybe the entire kitchen and the entire house is starting to smell of sweet Italian sausage, a peasant's dish brought over from the old world. Maybe outside the kitchen window, an iced over tree branch snaps with a sudden warmth. Maybe. Take that ordinary wooden cooking spoon and put it in the hands of someone you love or have loved and let them cook for you. Ralph Waldo Emerson says in his essay, Nature, that the poet's job is to be the one whose eye can integrate all the parts, can integrate all of the parts. That's yourself included. That may sound great, but integrating all the parts is a lot easier said than done, I'd argue. To do it, you have to slow yourself down and put yourself in a quiet, vulnerable space. And in this age of Twitter storms and the forthcoming fleet of Amazon drones delivering instant gratification to our doorsteps from the touch of a device we carry on our pockets 24 hours a day, slowing ourselves down and putting ourselves into a vulnerable space, it's become a notoriously difficult step for us. Some say it's impossible, but I think, I think that if we just simply start to recognize that each passing moment is something that is as rich and complex and elegant as a fine piece of chocolate or as a remarkably good glass of wine, then we can start, we can just barely scratch the surface that's starting to appreciate just how good we've all got it. We take so much for granted. Every single person here takes everything so much for granted every single day. But not today. Today I promise you, you are going to find your place in this world like a poet. So we are going to look at the person that we selected again. And this time, when you're looking at them, I want you to acknowledge that their body has known summer's heat and winter's cold and spring's passion and autumn's heartbreak. And that the person looking out from inside has a history and a future in their present form that is absolutely finite. And I want you, when I say go, to acknowledge them like this and be still with them. And open yourself up to the possibility of being completely vulnerable in all of our present completeness. Ready, set, go.
Okay, stop. You've just completed the second step towards finding your place in this world like a poet. That second step is vulnerability. Vulnerability means that you have now accepted the world around you just as the world around you has accepted you in turn. The world, after all, wants to accept us. It wants us to put down roots, and it helps our roots to take hold. It's the place where we love each other and hold each other and march and protest and bow to worship and learn customs and beg forgiveness. Our very existence in this room, on this planet, in this moment in time, is a passionate affront to non-existence. And as a poet, nowhere is our passion exerted more fiercely, I'd argue, and more memorably as it is through the vehicle of language within the halls of poetry. When asked for her personal definition of poetry, poet Ann Carson responded, if prose is a house, if prose is a house, then poetry is a man on fire running quite fast through it. Now, what I want to do is I want to put you in a, in a framework where you can understand a little bit about what I do with poetry and kind of what it means in the grand scheme of things. Try and recall, everybody in here, try and recall the first time that you ever told someone that you loved them. Not your mommy, not your daddy, not your grandpa, somebody outside of the family circle, slight caveat, when you didn't know if they were going to say, I love you back. Can you recall the space between the moment when the words escaped your mouth and the air into which they escaped? That's the place where poetry lives. But poetry, too, lives in the place where an exertion of words impresses some force on a take-it-for-granted social or cultural norm and then recoils at the slightest touch. Poems are themselves these kind of metaphors for both fragility and strength. It's why poets often read poems at funerals and at weddings. The Greek word for poem, poema, means made thing. Poems are made things that exist in spite of their transience, like an end table, or a Ferrari, or a fat gold watch. <laughs> and poems take on the features of their makers and the customs of the time and place in which they were created, and the way that big fat gold watch takes on the features of its maker and gives us a platform wherefrom we can view the mechanics of time and space. An item of clothing, a piece of jewelry, a particular perfume, these are all things that possess a history and a life of their own that we hardly ever notice and we rarely fully inspect. But today, like poets, we are taking none of that for granted. I'm going to ask you to look at the person one more time that you selected. And this time, I want you to take out whatever detail that was, no matter how small and seemingly insignificant. And I want you to re-examine it in this moment now. And I want you to acknowledge that that little detail contains an entire universe that is far, far greater than its own little, ordinary, mundane, overlooked existence. When I say go, five silent seconds, put your energy into it and look at that detail. Ready, set, go. Okay, stop. You just completed the final step towards finding your place in this world like a poet. That final step is passion. Passion is the light that we bring to the ordinary around us. According to Thomas Merton, each one of us possesses the light of a billion suns. If he was even half right, imagine just how bright we are in this room together right now. All around us, we feel, we know that there is this coming sadness of death, and yet we are inundated with the present and passionate joy of living in each of the items and components and features that we carry around with us through this journey called life, they possess an energy that is as remarkable and relevant as the walls around us, the chair beneath you, or the stage under my feet. The earth has been hurtling you through time and space for, 60, for 
at 67,000 miles per hour for your entire life. For your entire life. Think about that. And yet here we are together in this present stillness. Each of us is now exerting the immense pressure of ourselves into this place where we have now been fully integrated through awareness and vulnerability and passionate intensity, integrated like poets. This is a place you now fully belong. 